Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. And I'm Jess Budd. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock here on March 15th, 2019. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news shows each and every Friday morning. And to follow along with us in our show notes, just head over to marketingoclock.com for all the links from today's articles. And please subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. All right. First up this week is from Facebook, metrics updates to offer you more actionable business insights. And there are a lot of changes coming to Facebook as of April. So that was what they announced. And we're going to run through them here. Uh, The first one that they are changing is the relevance score. This is currently a single metric that measures how relevant your ads are to the audience that you reach. Um, And it's being replaced with three different metrics that break down relevance a little more granularly. So still getting some relevance data, but in a different way. And the first of those three new relevance scores is what they're calling quality ranking. And it's basically how your ads perceived quality is compared with ads competing for the same audience. And that's cool. It's similar to your quality score if you use Google Ads a lot. Mm -hmm. So I like this, and I also I love granularity, so I'm excited to see what else is coming. Yes, there are a few more for you if you're excited. The next one is engagement rate ranking. They describe this as how your ad's expected engagement rate is compared with ads competing for the same audience. Eh, this is this is a little <laughs> math for me, this one. Yeah. And, and it's nice that it's separated out. I, I actually like that, that it's not, you know, interfering with the quality ranking factor that's coming out. But for me, the engagement rate for many campaigns, especially performance-based campaigns, I don't really care that much about the engagement rate. Mm -hmm. You know, so many times it can actually hinder the performance of campaigns um, depending on what you're doing. So engagement rate, uh, you know, I'm not, it's cool. I like that it's separated, not super jazzed over that one though. Well, you can just ignore that one in the reporting. And how about this one that I'd like your opinion? Conversion rate ranking. This is how your ad's expected conversion rate is compared with ads that had the same optimization goal and competed for the same audience. Yeah, this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, the intent and thought is good. I'm just selfishly worried about clients. And yeah. you know what I mean? Like not all conversions are the same and a conversion rate in one industry or with a like-minded competitor, it does, it's not each conversion isn't the same. So to say that, you know, if I'm a premium product, but I'm in the same industry, you know, that it's going to, it's not going to be apples to apples. So that's why I think it's a nice try. But if it were me, you know, I'm just worried about people taking this as like gospel, like, oh yeah, I'm doing really bad. When in actuality, your product might be two, three X, the competitors that you're being compared against. That's very good insight. And I think a wise man, probably you, once said that not all conversions are created equal. So to put it simply, just something to worry about. The good news with this, though, is that these metrics are just for you as an advertiser to gauge how your ads are going to perform with your target audience and how they perceive you and will react to your ads. They don't actually affect any of your ads performance in the auction. So these are just insights for you. They're not going to actually change anything. So you should look at those and you should pay attention, but don't fret if you see a low score, just figure out what you need to do to improve. So that's good. That's the good news. Next up is a change to the potential reach report that you see when you're building out campaigns. And this is still within the Facebook new changes. Yes. Sorry. Not next up is a whole new story, but the next change from Facebook. And this one I like a lot. I think it actually makes sense uh, rather than just calculating the potential reach of your campaign or your ad set based on the total number of active monthly users, which is the way that it is now. They're going to change that and they're going to pare it down a little bit just to users that have actually been served an ad within the last 30 days. And that's huge because there are sections of Facebook where users don't see ads and they shouldn't be included in your potential reach because you will not reach them. It's not even a potential. You just won't. Yeah, that seems like a common sense there. Yeah, I feel like this one makes sense and we can all get on board with that. So the last change, which is actually a bunch of changes that Facebook is making is a total of seven metrics that they're going to be sunsetting in favor of what they call more actionable ones. So one of those seven is the relevance score that we just talked about. There's also, um, if you look at offers being saved, that's now being replaced with a post saves metric. And there's a whole list of these and you can get it in the show notes. It breaks down 
all the seven metrics that are going away and what they're being replaced with. So check the show notes. Yep. Head over to marketingtheclock.com to see everything. Exactly. And from the looks of this, um, because I did peek at it, obviously, I feel like it's going to be an improvement overall. Uh, Whether you disagree with some of the, uh, the changes that they're making, what marketer doesn't want more granular data? The bad ones? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So don't be one of those bad ones. Take this as an opportunity to dive deeper into your campaigns. And obviously, if you're using any of these metrics in your client reporting, don't forget to swap those. All right. And now off of Facebook and over to Google. And I am not going to list the name of this article because it might confuse you. So <laughs> what happened this week is Google has launched a broad core search update. And it was first reported over at Search Engine Journal. And the name of the article was Google Big Update Florida 2. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. I thought you weren't going to name the article. Oh, I just wanted to make sure people know what's happening. There's a big, broad core search update that occurred. And okay. it occurred on March 12th. Now, what happened is Danny Sullivan over at Google had put out a tweet saying this week, we released a broad core algorithm update as we do several times per year. Other information, this is international. So it's going out everywhere all at once. And there was a question asked, I believe Barry Schwartz asked a question about how long will this take? And Danny referenced something, uh, some previous tweets saying that it usually takes about a week or more. And this is where it gets silly. (laughs) So I mentioned the fact that it was dubbed Florida 2. And in case you don't know what Florida 1 was, <laughs> it happened in 20, or not even, you can't even say 20 during that, unless you say, say 2003, oh, yeah, but that sounds bad. That. No. I think you just say 03. So 2003, there was an update, a big update that occurred, and it had targeted more of the spammy side of things, and there was a pub con happening down in Florida, so Brett Tabke had dubbed it Florida back at the time. For some reason, this one got dubbed Florida 2. <laughs> it's still rolling out. It doesn't have anything to do with Florida 1 from what it appears. So that is a little confusing. Do you think they just ran out of names? And they're like, well, let's just pick one we've already had and just give it a part de. There are 49 other states, Jess. Why do we have a name after the state? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I can't, maybe, maybe, maybe. Also, I appreciate that you clarified that the original update was just called Florida, not Florida One at <laughs> yeah, the time. It wasn't called Florida One, it was Florida. <laughs> so anyway, then there was a post coming out from Barry uh, over at, I believe this one was at Search Engine Land, and the title of the post was, Let's Clear Things Up. <laughs> Google's Florida 2 algorithm update is not related to original Florida update. Which just makes everything confusing. Yep. And so then yesterday, Danny Sullivan came out on Twitter again and said, so we've not typically given the core updates a name because we want people to focus on what they're about. Core updates. As opposed to, say, speed update that we did name that was about site speed. Our preference is any name continuing to use core in it. So... I don't think Florida 2 is going to stick with this, but you know, as of this week, if you hear the core update March 12th, 2019, it's the same as Florida 2. <laughs> and again, Danny followed that up by saying there's a strong preference that the update's core plus a date so that everyone can easily know what it's about. Of course, core update March 2019 doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. I second that. Uh, but that's what it was, and there's no confusing it with other things. So that's from Google itself. Now let's talk about the core update March 2019, a.k.a. Florida 2. <laughs> and so far, Glenn Gabe, friend of the show, at Glenn Gabe on Twitter, had some analysis and examples and had a few different sites. I believe one of them was Dr. Axe, which sounds kind of like a murder. I was going to say, that sounds violent. Yeah, either. We should just rename it Florida3.com. <laughs> yeah, but uh, apparently Dr. Axe.com... Uh, it had a, a big comeback, I guess, from some of the, the previous core updates. And remember, some of the other core updates we thought might be towards um, some of the eat items or your money or your life. Um, but SEM Rush also gave some information on this update, it said that it's about the same on desktop versus mobile, but that the most affected categories so far are autos and vehicles and health and pets and animals. So that's what you got. There's an update in March. I don't care what the name is. Check your <laughs> check your rank and check your search console. And I haven't seen much, to be honest with you. No. But 
you know, we're not dabbling over here in the dark arts. <laughs> so we didn't have pets and animals space. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't really seen anything, any, any major drops from the first core update that was also improperly dubbed medic at the time. So just stick to core updates, folks, and check your analytics and see if you've got anything. Overall, though, the sentiment that I've seen is generally positive. Well, that's good. I like when things end on a positive because that was a rough one. That was a lot. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And it all boils down to Florida too, which I don't think rolls off the tongue either. So they could have done better. All right. Last in our main stories here is a lovely message from Google, our commitment to help you with policy compliance. So Google wants to protect its users from bad actors, which are their words, not mine. Wait, what did Nick Cage ever do to Google? <laughs> 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 only grace it with many, many memes that he himself did not create, but is the subject of. So, <laughs> that was funny. Google also wants to help good advertisers avoid making mistakes that violate their policies. So they've got some new features rolling out that will, quote, help you achieve your full campaign potential by allowing you to easily navigate the policy restrictions that may affect your ads. That is a lot of words. It is. So what is coming from this policy compliance update? Excellent question, Greg. The answer is several things. <laughs> the first one being a policy manager, which sounds really boring, but it's going to be useful. It's one centralized place where users can log in and view any policy restrictions across their entire account. This is for Google Ads, I should say. I don't know if I said that. <clears throat> So it'll look at your ads, your keywords, your extensions, you know, everything where you could possibly have a violation. And it'll give you recommendations to fix any issues you have. And eventually, I don't know if this is um, rolled out yet, but you're going to be able to see a history of any appeals that you've made too, which is nice to have a record. When I think policy manager, it sounds like an app that an insurance company would make. You know, here, <laughs> we've got a brand new policy manager. <laughs> Or the, maybe that's like a job. It's like, yeah, I'm a Ooh. policy manager, level two. Senior policy manager. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> level two. Level three, probably. I like that. Well, don't worry too much because you might not even need this because Google's also working to be able to give you feedback on possible violations right in real time when you're creating your ads, which is also really nice. So there's an animation in the article. Again, head over to marketingclock.com to find the show notes if you want to look at this. But it shows somebody trying to build out an ad in the online interface and they put one too many exclamation points in there and they're notified right away of a possible violation. They're not able to save the ad and it gives them recommendations right in the moment on how to fix it. And they need one of those for real life. Too. <laughs> hey, you, you use too many slammers. Get rid of an exclamation point. I like slammers. I don't like them in ads. I do think that they look really spammy, but in an email, you might get three if I'm really excited. Oh, okay. In the same sentence. All right. Yeah, well, I'm so. keep you away from the policy manager. <laughs> so watch out. Google's also making changes to make it easier to see why an ad's disapproved too, if you're having issues with that and streamline the appeals process. So those are the real changes that are happening. They did follow up with a blog post too with some fluffy rhetoric. If you want to read about their motivations behind it, that link is also in the show notes. But details that you need, we got. All right. And that brings us to this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. First up from Rank Ranger. There are more product images showing in thumbnails on search. On March 7th, Rank Ranger had taken a look at the mobile image thumbnails and saw a increase from 40% up to 67% of mobile mobile results on the search engine results pages had images. That is a 27% increase. Let me do my from the math department. I, I'm going to need a TI-85 to, to figure that one out. <laughs> um, so basically, there were a few spikes that really jumped things up that happened earlier in March, and now those image thumbnails appear much higher, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it, uh, usually right next to the title and the snippet underneath it, you'll see an image that's being pulled there, and it mainly happens on products. Um, and this also appears to be gearing towards more product-focused images. So, Jess, what are your thoughts on these, you know, additional image thumbnails pulling into the SERPs? I like them. I think especially if it's product-related. I mean, people are lazy and people are visual. So hopefully this will help get the click through. Of course, if you have a decent image there, if you have a product image with a fuzzy background, people can't tell what it is. It's not going to help you. But photos get to the point. I like it. 
I don't know. What do you think? Me too. I, I, I'm I'm typically Grandpa Greg over here that likes <laughs> the, the 10 blue links. Yeah. But in this case, yeah, you pull an image into something and you can actually see one of the examples. If you click on through and look at the Rank Ranger site, it was wheelchairs. And, yeah. and it actually was very, very helpful looking at that and seeing the different wheelchairs listed. So I'm all for it. Love it. More of it, please. Agree. I don't think we need it for everything, but this is a very good use of it. Okay. So you may or may not know that over the last couple of months, Amazon has been doing some work to streamline operations in their DSP. And if you didn't know, they wrote an article this week announcing everything because everything's officially rolled out. So if you're wondering what some of those updates are, they... They called it an update to navigation, but I was looking at it and it's really a completely retooled interface in their DSP. There's a new layout and it has what they call more intuitive usability. So I think that's always a plus when it's easier to use something. They've also um, added bulk editing features so you can bulk edit domain, audience and location targeting settings, which is great because people got less time these days. Bulk editing's good. And uh, they've also updated custom reports that are now officially customizable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> From the sound of the article, it made it seem like you weren't, like these custom reports existed before and you weren't able to actually fully customize them. And you can now, you can actually pick the columns that you want in your report, which sounds like it should be common sense, but this is an update. And you can now save these reports and have them emailed out as well. They're working finally to shorten turnaround time on creative approval too, which I think is probably one of the biggest advantages here, but lots of new and exciting stuff for Amazon. Yeah, and I, I know we talked about the Facebook changes coming mm -hmm. in April, and I like that they shipped this one prime, and we got it now. <laughs> so, all right, next up this week, a new query builder tool is available for the Google Ads API that we talked about arrived last week week. Mm -hmm. And this is a simple online tool that matters for us marketers because it's easy for you non-developers to format specific queries, see what you can slice and dice, and then execute that yourself so that you can see what information you can pull out of Google Ads. And then if you want to, you can take that syntax and give it to your developers. So it's cool because you can see what you can do and grab that information and pass it off and you know exactly that it can be done. Yes, and you're going to look super smart to the developer nerds that usually make fun of you for getting things wrong. Here's my syntax. Yeah. <laughs> if you say it like that, guaranteed you'll win the room. <laughs> All right, next up, Facebook is testing features that let pages archive and share stories. That's the headline. Pretty straightforward. The subhead is a Facebook spokesperson said the company is always looking to bring more stories features to pages. And Greg, I know what a big fan of stories you are. So when you read that, weren't you just tickled? Oh, tickled or ticked off? What did well, you say? <laughs> I said tickled, but I know the real answer. <laughs> no, I don't really care, to I know be honest you don't. with you. I don't. But for those that do, uh, this is just a test now. And if it goes wide, the changes basically here are that pages will be able to archive their stories. So they don't go away right away. People will be, still be able to access them. And what I think is more important here is that users will then be able to share the story. So if you ever go to a page and you can share their posts, you can even share their ads, you can't share their stories. And if this goes wide, you will be able to. So I think that that's actually useful for anyone out there that's a business that is creating stories on Facebook. All right. Well, another good story is developing over on Google where they're introducing two new things that are very germane to games. And first up, there's a new app campaigns for engagement within Google Ads that can help people rediscover a game by engaging with them by relevant ads across Google properties. So let's say that somebody downloaded a game, maybe just read the tutorial, you can now re-engage with these ads, those people that didn't get through and actually play the game um, and so you can say, hey, we've got new features since the last time you've been on, or you can try to get people back into the game. So I think that's cool. It's a ability to hit people kind of lower in the funnel. You got them to download the app, didn't do anything. <laughs> so now hit them again and try to get them to actually use the app. Uh, Facebook's done this for a while. And, you know, it's not everything's always about the, the app installs, right? And we want mm -hmm. people to install an app to do something on it. So this is, is pretty nice. The other item is that Google is going to help those app makers generate revenue from non-spending players. How do you do that, you might think? <laughs> well, ads. And 
Google said that their internal data shows that on average, less than 4% of players will ever spend on in-app items. So it's a new approach to monetization and it combines ads and in-app purchases in one solution that's smart segmentation. So it uses machine learning to segment players based on their likelihood of, hey, are you going to buy something in this game or are you not going to buy something in this game? I'm going to use an example. I know a person named Jess Bud. Who's who, that? <laughs> who at one point <laughs> would spend a good amount of money on a game called Candy Crush. It's true. And so since that spending spree, she stopped. I did. Cold turkey. Got so help. we're going to have old Jess and new Jess in this example. Old Jess would spend a lot of money on Candy Crush with these new ads. She'd hop into Candy Crush and they'd say, come on in and play. Here, have a seat. We've got some candy you can crush. Oh, <laughs> do you like the terrible toothbrush? You can kill more candy that way and here, pay me. You don't know how this game works. I have no idea. <laughs> but basically, they didn't have any friction in between Jess and the game. Now, Jess, who doesn't spend any money, mm -mm. comes to Candy Crush, has to sit through ads in order to start crushing that candy. So again, it's the best of both, both worlds for the, average, for the app creator. Maybe not for the, the uh, <laughs> Jess who just wants to play her game and not spend any not money spend anymore. Money. Yeah, I never should have crushed that habit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. But it's brilliant from a marketing perspective, for sure. I just as an end user, I'm offended. <laughs> I thought I beat the system and they're coming to get me. <laughs> Okay, next up, a big thank you to Mary Hartman for pointing something out that is um, awesome. She tweeted this week about some new sweet targeting options that Google Ads has added to their affinity audience builder. And you can now create affinity audiences based off of place and app criteria. So place being like a physical place and it doesn't have to be like Buffalo, New York. It could be grocery store in the example that um, she had the screenshot for. The only caveat with this though is that if you use places and this is not a caveat with the app criteria, it's just with places that targeting will then limit the use of your audience to just video campaigns on YouTube, which is kind of interesting. And I, I can't imagine it would be like that forever. I think it'll go away because that seems like pretty powerful targeting. I'd want to use it everywhere. Yeah, and I feel like this wasn't either announced right or we missed it completely. Exactly. Because this is pretty big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fact that you could be like, hey, I'm going to target people that use Google Fit and I've got a scale that, that connects directly with Google Fit. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, this is actually pretty powerful. So check it out. Again, everything's in the show notes yeah. and the ability to target by app or by place. Next up is from Search Engine Roundtable and... John Mueller over at Google had a Hangouts and he said that he believes all sites writing a separate mobile URL for their mobile site solution should work on moving those implementations to a responsive site design instead. Now, before everybody freaks out, he also said, because it was easier to manage. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like a news article, but again, easier to manage. Is that fair though? I, I feel like yeah, things should be easier to manage. We can all advocate for that. But to take an official stance on something and have it just be because you want to benefit the user, is that fair? There's either a secret motivation here or the guy is just maybe not staying in his lane. I mean, <laughs> I think it's just like general advice. Right. Like, hey, having one website is easier than maintaining two websites. Yeah. And if you've got an M dot everything, it's tough and it's hard and it's hard for everybody. I know, but you're just really banking on the fact that people are going to read your whole statement. You're going to set the internet on fire. You know what else set the internet on fire? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if you read the comments on this article. There's a great one that oh, I boy. found, and I'm going to read it to you people. It's story time. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long, but I'm going to read the start and I'm going to let you know how it ends. It starts with, my 56K modem from AOL <laughs> hooked to my brand new Windows 98 computer runs great. I like to browse internet websites on the cyber web or the way these youngsters call it, the World Wide Web. And he goes on to talk about some things that really have nothing to do with the article at all. And then this guy whose username, by the way, is just wow. <laughs> he ends his comment with, anyway, going to test a, a time travel magic. And I just thought that that was great. I just feel like, you know what? Just go out there and comment your heart out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or man. <All> right. Yeah. <laughs> Setting the internet on fire. Okay. Next, 
we have an article from Google and it's called With Lookout, Discover Your Surroundings with the Help of AI. And this is pretty awesome. Lookout's a new app that is so far only available on Pixel devices, but it should be coming elsewhere soon. And it uses AI to aid people who are blind and visually and or visually impaired. And what Google says it does or what it is designed for is to work in situations where people might typically have to ask for help, like learning about a new space for the first time, reading text and documents, or completing daily routines such as cooking, cleaning, and shopping. So that's a pretty sweet use of AI. Yeah, sure. yeah, and it's cool. You can the examples they have you have a you can point your phone at something and it says like dog. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's a dog right there. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's, that's sweet. It's, yeah, it's cool. So I, I actually want to download that and try it. And, and do you have a Pixel? Report back. Yeah, I do. Oh, I do not. I have an iPhone. Next up, help Google Search know the best date for your web page. And Google gave out a helpful statement that talks about how they determine the date that shows up next to a search result listing many times. And Google says that they use a variety of factors, including, but not limited to, any prominent date listed on the page itself or dates provided by the publisher through structured markup. Can we call that structured date? Uh? Yes. <laughs> Begrudgingly. <laughs> Begrudgingly, <You're welcome>. yes. <laughs> and so, again, Google doesn't depend on one single factor because some of them can be prone to issues. They also talked about Google News and that Google News requires clearly showing both the date and the time that the content was published or updated. One thing that I thought was really interesting was that they say if the article was substantially changed, then you give it a fresh date and fresh time. I like that. Of course you should. And that brings us to this week's WTH. W. T. H. And this week's WTH comes from Wired. It has Wired has a story called Facebook can make VR avatars look and move exactly like you. And this is about something called Kodak avatars from Facebook Reality Labs. It's a result of a process that uses machine learning to collect, learn, and then recreate human social expression. What you see in this article <laughs> is the learning of Facebook labs taking, or Facebook reality labs taking images of people's face and then showing them side by side, replicating them. And in one point in this article, there's a GIF showing the, the avatar and the human going back and forth. And it is near indistinguishable. You really can't tell the difference. It's terrifying. So it, are the faces these people are making. Yes, that is terrifying too. And then I watched a video and they're talking about like yoga or oh, something. That's the most like, oh, annoying video I've ever watched. <laughs> ever watched? <laughs> that's a bold statement. Yeah, it might not be true. <laughs> it's up there. But it, it is so creepy how realistic these people are. It is, again, almost indistinguishable. Yeah. And I've drawn the line personally. Um. That's big from you because you like, I, I mean, you called yourself Grandpa Greg earlier, but there are things that you like that I don't that are like too new and scary for me. You draw the line here. You're not into this. No, I mean, I get it that that's the future. We're all going to be sitting in some massage chair, <laughs> having tea parties with other people across the globe that aren't really there. But but I'm out on that. I'm not, I'm not going to be participating. <laughs> yeah. It's just too much for me. It's just too much for me. So, I mean, the big thing is, this world that we live in is pretty cool. It's not bad. No, and I, I'm all right with it. Yeah. Like, I'll take it, and I don't need a different world, and I don't need the avatar. Maybe ask me that when I'm, like, down the road and decrepit and old. <laughs> maybe but, maybe that. I'll be like, hey, yeah, give me the young avatar. But me. you're not, because it looks exactly like you now, right? So unless you create this avatar now, you're not going to be able to use oh, the young Oh, so I might miss out. Oh, well. Just saying. I don't know. I, I'm wondering if you're a robot over there or a robot, whatever this is. If you're, Are you an avatar? Yeah, it's my I Kodak avatar right yeah. here. I'm <laughs> actually sitting at home in a beanbag. <laughs> That's your, your chair of choice. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's not a bad chair. I love a good beanbag. I don't know. We talked last week, I think, or maybe the week before about the physical world and how great it is. Yeah, we can just stay here. This is just like Black Mirror, and I forget the name of it, but it's when... It's a great episode. We'll put it in the show notes, but yeah. this is totally Black Mirror stuff. Very Black Mirror stuff. This uh, this entire show is starting to be about Black Mirror stuff. That's why we call it WTH, <laughs> <laughs> or this segment. Anyway, what's next? This week's cool tool. 
Sweet. So this week's cool tool is a Chrome extension, and it lets you automatically hide the worst posts on Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Discuss. And when we say the worst posts, it's the worst comments. We're talking about comments here. So this Chrome extension is called Tune, aka tuning that garbage out. And it's from the folks over at Jigsaw. So it will, as of now, at least only work on the platforms that I just mentioned. So Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Discuss. But it's a pretty sweet AI-powered filter that automatically hides comments that it determines to be toxic which is sweet. And it uses Jigsaw's AI that is called Perspective. It's not new. It's been monitoring and flagging comments as spam since about 2017. So I think we can expect this to work reasonably well. And we can also trust it because Google trusts it. They implemented it on YouTube to help channel owners better moderate comments. So if you're sick of seeing rubbish and you want to tune it out, go add tune to Chrome. And uh, thanks to Alfred Ng over at CNET for calling this one out. It's pretty sweet. And this is also another Black Mirror episode <laughs> where there's the one where you can't see anything terrible and it gets blurred out. So we'll link over to both of those Black Mirror episodes. <laughs> but yeah, you, I mean, I get it. There's certain things that you don't want to see. Yeah. But what, you, there's a little bit of a moral line you have to cross there. But there is. again, if you're very sensitive to it and you have the ability to turn it off, hey, Check it out. Or maybe if you have kids, right? And yeah, they have absolutely. like a, you can just put them on that Chrome and then have the, the real world for you later. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. And that brings us to this week's must read marketing article of the week. An article so in depth, so detailed that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on the show. And this week's, ep- this week's article comes from Vanessa Fox of Key Lime Toolbox and former Webmaster Central fame, but she created an article called Key SEO Metrics, Branded versus Non-Branded Google Organic Search Traffic. And though it's sort of a bland title, there's nothing bland about the information here. She says that you should really look at your traffic by kind of three things, branded queries, non-branded queries, and irrelevant queries. And then you should break down those buckets and see how it performs differently. Then it goes into a huge in-depth look at how to track the value, how to get the tracking actually implemented, how to look at that performance once you do, and there are just tons of tactics to get you where you need to go. Some of them do use KeyLime Toolbox, which is her product, but again, it's a very, very tangible takeaway article, which are the things that we love here on Marketing Clock. So thank you, Vanessa. Yes, thank you. And all right, that does it for today's show. It is now officially not Marketing O'Clock. Remember, you can catch everything from this show on marketingoclock.com. And please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week.